Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians this morning as we can continue our study in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 is where we will be this morning. Uh, we're going to begin reading this morning in verse number 12. So when you found your place, I'd invite you to please stand with me as we read God's Word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 12, Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Verse 13, Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality... Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or number 19, just a few more verses. The Bible says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now let's go to the Lord and pray. Lord, thank you again for allowing us to gather together as your body as a church, and Lord, I thank you for the preparation that you have allowed us to have as we've been over the past few weeks preparing our hearts uh, in this season of Advent, of waiting, uh, over the past few weeks as families and as individuals and even as a church family, we've set aside time to build anticipation, to look back at all the promises in the Old Testament and see how you perfectly fulfilled them through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I'm thankful we were able to be reminded of those things this morning. But I'm also asking as we turn our hearts towards this passage, as we go verse by verse through 1 Corinthians, I pray that you would allow us to understand what you have before us. Help us, uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, to be able to see what you originally meant in this passage and ap apply it directly to our lives over 2,000 years later. Uh, Lord, I do ask for your help this morning and that you would keep us on track. I pray that I would say nothing uh, in the flesh, but that I would be led by your Spirit. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, what you've already done in our service. Uh, we're eagerly waiting to see how you're going to challenge our hearts through this passage. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, church family, you can be seated. So... As we continue on in our study here in 1 Corinthians, we've looked at a lot of different things, and I'm actually super excited about uh, the next few topics we're going to talk about as well. Uh, over the next few weeks, Lord willing, uh, we're going to be able to see different topics come up in our study. We're going to be able to see different principles in which we can take from God's Word and apply directly to our marriages. It's going to be super helpful. I'm really looking forward to that. But you may be here this morning and say, well, I'm not married. Uh, I can't look forward to the next few weeks. Well, the good news is, in these very same passages, uh, we're, we also have principles talking about singleness, how to glorify God as a single person. So maybe uh, you haven't united in marriage yet, or uh, maybe the Lord has given you certain gifts. Uh, but to make a long story short, there's a lot of good things that we have to look forward to. There's also particular passages about those who are widows, or maybe you're a widower this morning. There's so much packed into 1 Corinthians, and I really think it's going to help the church. I believe it already has. But this morning we find ourselves here in chapter 6, and in the past Paul's addressed a lot of different issues, a lot of different sins within the church of Corinth. Uh, he's talked about different sexual sins within the church. Uh, in fact, there were people within the church that were involved in sexual immorality. Uh, a man was in a relationship with his stepmother. We talked about that a few weeks ago. I mean, this is some pretty crazy stuff. You can't just make this up. 
Uh, we've talked about how uh, they were dragging other sins into the church there at Corinth. Uh, there were people that were super greedy, super selfish. We talked about the context of everyone there uh, in this context was involved in the legal system at some point. Uh, in fact, there were people, Christians within the church that were suing each other. Uh, I mean, there's just been a lot we've talked about so far. But here we are in verses 12 through 20, and we're going to continue to address this topic of sexual immorality. You see, this church there at Corinth was a lot like the church today, a lot like the world today. Uh, they tried to justify their sexual sin. They looked around and they said, what's the big deal? I mean, what's the big deal about sexual immorality? It, it, it's part of life. Uh, you, you know, God created it. What's wrong with it? What is wrong with us pursuing any sort of relationship that we want? Uh, you know, it's there. You do it. Don't be uptight. That was the mentality of the church at Corinth. And sadly, that's trickled into the church today and especially within our society. So, again, this church, I want you guys to understand, was directly smack dab in the middle of the world. It was so easy for them to blend in, to become camouflaged Christians, to just do what everybody else was doing. In fact, during the first few centuries, there was a term coined to Corinthianize. Uh, that meant to have sex with a prostitute. So this culture was just eat up with sexual sin. And so Paul has to address this. He didn't just let sin slide. He was a loving pastor. And so he, he confronted it head on. And so what we see in our passage here this morning is how what Paul's doing is he's warning the church uh, about three things that sexual sin does to the body. He's warning them about uh, why sexual sin needs to be removed from the Christian life. And I'll, I'll go ahead and give you our three points this morning. They're not, they're not overcomplicated. They're pretty simple, but when applied directly, I, I think they'll be very helpful. So number one, sexual sin harms. Uh, we're going to talk about all of these uh, in detail, but I want to shoot them out to you right quick. Sexual sin harms. Sexual sin also controls. And sexual sin also perverts. So let's start with number one this morning. We, we begin reading in verse number 12. Let's start there. Let's see how sexual sin harms. It was harming the church at Corinth, and it, it also harms the church today. Look in your Bibles at, at verse number 12. The Bible says this, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Uh, what This word helpful here in the original Greek is the word soon pharaoh. It literally means profitable. So what Paul is saying here is all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. Paul is saying, okay, uh, there are Christians sometimes who do get caught up in the sin of sexual immorality. Does God forgive the sin of sexual immorality? The answer to that is if you are in Christ, if you uh, have committed adultery and you're in Christ, the blood, yes, does cover that. God does forgive sexual immorality. But the, but the price to pay is high. And that's what Paul's trying to get at here in verse number 12. There's a high price to pay. And what we're also going to see here in these next few verses is that sexual sin in particular has harm built into it. Uh, in order to do that, in order to see the consequences of sexual sin, I would like you to hold your place there in 1 Corinthians I'd like to also call your attention to Proverbs chapter number 5. So go ahead and be turning to Proverbs chapter number 5. See, there is no other sin besides sexual immorality that, that has the potential to have this deep-rooted damage as this one does. There have been a many of men and many of women who have fallen into sexual immorality. In fact, sexual immorality has taken more men and women out than drugs and alcohol combined. Uh, I, I want you to read with me Proverbs chapter 5 and beginning in, in verse number 3. I want you to see the consequences here. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5, beginning in verse number 3, it says, For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. <laughs> 
and her speech is smoother than oil. So the way Proverbs is conveying this is sexual sin, those relationships outside of God's will, they're enticing. Uh, you think about honeycomb. He, he, he uses the words here smooth, and he uses the word lips. He's, he's talking about how enticing sexual sin is. But, but then he, he goes on. Uh, notice what happens in verse number 4. He says, But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. And then look at verse number 5. It says, Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. You see, the way sexual sin works, the way the forbidden woman works, is this. She always over-promises. Things look good, but she always under-delivers. It, it isn't what you see whenever it comes to sexual sin isn't necessarily what you get. And notice in this next verse, we're going to get a little bit of advice. Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 6. Uh, it goes on and says, She does not ponder the path of life, her ways wander. She does not know it. Now verse 7, here's the advice. And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Notice what, he, what he's saying here. In verse number 6, this woman's sneaky. She's subtle. And in verse number 8, Here's the advice. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Uh, see, you won't have a problem with sexual sin. You won't have the problem with adultery if you stay away from it. And that's pretty basic advice. Just stay away. And that's what we see here in verse number 8. Uh, now look at verse number 9. What happens if you do engage in this sexual sin? Verse 9 says, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. You know what happens when a person engages in sexual sin? They lose their honor. They lose their respect. Uh, that's what we see there in verse number 9. Then verse number 10 gives us more consequences of sexual sin. The Bible says, Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. What's he saying there? There's been a many of men and a many of women who have engaged in sexual immorality and it's come at an expense. An expense in many different ways. Financially it comes with an expense. You hear story after story of where a man falls into a relationship with a woman and he ends up the rest of his life having to pay some sort of alimony. She robs him blind. That can happen. There's many men who have destroyed their life financially because of Falling into a wrong relationship. They're burdened. They can barely even meet their own needs because they've fallen into this trap. Now, but he doesn't end there. Look in your Bibles at verse number 11. Now, the Bible goes on to say, And at the end of your life you groan when your, fle when your flesh and your body are consumed. See, eventually, these people that fall into the trap of sexual immorality get to a point where uh, physically and sexually, they can't function any longer. That, that, that over-promised and under-delivered, they get to the end of their life and all they have is pain and sorrow and they look back at their life and they're still not fulfilled. That's what he, he's talking about here in verse number 11. And notice, when you get to that point at the end of your life, look at what, what you'll say in verse number 12. And you say, how I hated discipline, and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ears to my, to my instructors. So there are real consequences that we see because of sexual sin. But, but God isn't against sex. I, I just need to lay that out before we go on. In fact, look on down in your Bibles at verse number 18. The Bible shows us the right context for sexual relationship. Verse number 18 says this. It says, let your fountain be blessed. What is he talking about here? He's literally referring to man's ability to procreate in verse number 18. And he goes on to say this. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. 
a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. By intoxic- be intoxicated always in her love. You guys see the picture here? Like God's not against it. In fact, it's the opposite. He's saying enjoy in its right, proper context. Now, look at verse number 20. He says, Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? He says in verse number 21, For a man's, eye, a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. And he ponders all of his past. Why would you go out and commit sexual sin? You may think nobody else is looking, nobody else will find out. But who is always there? Who is always looking according to verse number 21? The eyes of the Lord. He knows. So again, I want you to... Uh, Look in your Bibles at Proverbs chapter 6. This is why it's important you bring your Bible to church. Because I could be up here rambling off, saying whatever I want, but if you've got your Bible in front of you, you can read it for yourself. So Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 23. He says this, For the commandment is a lamp and a light, uh, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. So God's Word's going to keep you away from sexual immorality. It's going to keep you on the right path. And, and then, look at verse number 24. It says, To preserve you from the evil woman, and from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. It says in verse 25, Do not desire her beauty in your heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. You've got to watch those eyelashes, right? According to verse 25. I think Maybelline capitalized on this marketing. They knew men would struggle with that. Anyways, let's keep going. Uh, Look at verse number uh, 26. Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 26. There's a reason why I'm sharing you all all of this. This is, I'm going to get to that. But look at verse number 26. It says, For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. He says in, in verse number 27, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? He's saying in verse 27, If you think you can commit sexual sin and get away with it, you can't. The Lord's always watching. Your sin, and everybody needs to hear this this morning, because there's people that may be tempted to draw into the closet spaces of their life, into the darkness, and continue to indulge in sexual sin and think, I'm never, I'm never going to be found out. But I want you to understand that's a lie from Satan. Your sin will find you out, and the Lord sees the sin that you're committing. And he goes on to say this in verse number 27. He says, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Can you do that? Can you gather up fire next to your clothes and not be burned? No, you can't. Neither can you get away with your sexual sin. Verse 28, he says it again, Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? No, the answer is no way. You cannot do that. Look on down. We're almost done with Proverbs. Look on down. uh, Verse number 32, the the first part. It says, He who commits adultery lacks sin. Sense. I've looked for a word to try to describe what he's saying here in this verse. And the best word, I don't allow my kids to say it, uh, but it, the, very, the man who commits adultery is, is stupid. I mean, that's, that's the literal meaning of what that verse says. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He's, he's stupid. Now, why? Why would we call someone like that stupid? Look at verse number 32, the last part. Why? He does it. He who does it destroys himself. That's why he lacks sense. He thinks it's promising life. He thinks it's this, this, this pleasure he can indulge in or she can indulge in. But in the end, it is destroying them from the inside out. So, does God forgive this sin? Yes. But what we need to understand as Christians is even though God forgives this sin, it's causing harm to our life. Now, look at chapter number 7. Uh, Verse number 4. Proverbs chapter 7, verse number 4. The Bible says, Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend. 
to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. Now verse 6, he gets into an illustration. He's painting a picture for us. He says, For at the window of my house I've looked out through my lattice. He's lo- this man's looking out through his window. What does he see? Verse number 7. And I have seen among the simple, this is the, the stupid one, the unwise. He says, I have perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense. That, that's pretty much the case for a lot of youth, right? They have no direction, they have no sense, they just go whichever way the wind blows or their nose is pointed. And, and he's, this man's looking out through his window, and that's who he sees. And, and he goes on to say in verse number 8, Passing along the, the street near her corner, he's talking about the prostitute, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. Now what does this woman do? This woman of adulteress, this sinful woman. Look at verse number uh, 10. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute. And the translation I'm reading out of says, wily of heart. I mean, she has a real hard heart. She's loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him and with bold face says uh, to him, Now, this woman right here is pretty forward, right? Uh, She's very direct. And then it says in verse number 14, I had to offer sacrifices and today I paid my vows. What does that mean? This uh, adulterous woman says, hey, I've, I've got my religion taken care of. I've done what I need to do. Now I can go do whatever I want. And then verse number 15 says, So now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and have found you. I've spread my couch uh, with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. So, That's pretty enticing, right? Everything she's saying, boy, that that sounds pretty good. But now things start to get sobered. Look at verse number 19. For my husband is not at home, for he has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon he will have come home. Here's a young man who probably isn't trained in God's Word. His parents probably weren't very intentional with him as he grew up. He just kind of did what everybody else did. He just goes where other people go. And he gets trapped. He gets ensnared by sexual sin. You don't see him skipping off with this woman and living happily ever after. In fact, what does the Bible say? Verse number 21. With much seductive speech she persuades him, and with her smooth talk she compels him. How did the, how's the story end? Look at verse number 22. All at once he follows her, as an ox goes to slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast, till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. So, here's a young man. He was a fool. He responded incorrectly to sexual temptation. Now, why do I share these passages when we're studying 1 Corinthians? What, what's the point in all this? There's been many of people that I've counseled or I've talked to or just many people that we encounter in our daily life that says, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I've taken care of the essential matters. In fact, whenever I was in Bible school, around 10 years old, I walked an aisle. I've got my religion taken care of, so now I just want to live my life like everybody else. See, that's a problem. And that's, that was the case in the, at the church of Corinth. They, weren't, they were just going with the flow. They, they weren't separating from sexual sin. They thought, well, I've got forgiveness. I can just live like the world. But what they didn't understand is that there's built-in harm, even though God forgives, with sexual sin. There's people in this room that could testify this morning for the harm that they live with every single day because they engaged in sexual sin sin. They have those memories. They have those scars. They've had to stand at the, at the front of a church as their uh, spouse walks down the aisle or, or, or so on and so forth. Yeah, God forgave them for that sin, but every day Satan likes to throw it up in front of them. 
There's a reason why we deal with this passage, and there's a reason why I'm passionate about this this morning. Because I want you to see and heed the warning that there is real pain that comes with sexual sin. Sexual sin will harm, it will destroy, and it will tear. There's a lot of other examples in Proverbs. I'd like to shift gears. Let's turn back to 1 Corinthians. There's an example that we're going to read about here in a few weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 18, where people were engaged in sexual sin and God didn't put up with it. In fact, 23,000 Israelites died in one day because of sexual sin. Another example is King David. You guys remember him? King David God loved and, and King David God forgave. But King David committed a, adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. King David went out on his rooftop and looked down at the lower roof and there was a woman there sunbathing. What did he do? He saw, he desired, and he, he, he desired to execute those desires. So he sent for and went through the process of committing adultery. You see, for King David, sin looked good. It overpromised, but boy, it underdelivered. Then, after he committed that sin, he wrote Psalm 51. The man was devastated. I mean, he was destroyed. David paid for that sin every day of his life. He never forgot it. It destroyed him. It destroyed his family. It destroyed other families. And guess what? When we get to Psalm 51, it isolated him. King David was lonely at that point. You know, sexual sin does that to people. It isolates them. Why? Why does it isolate them? Because they're afraid someone might find out. So they draw up. They don't want anybody to know what they're doing when nobody else was looking. Sexual sin led King David to a place where he was physically sick. He was worried. His conscience was eaten up in the inside. He wrote Psalm 51. Now, did the Lord forgive King David? Yes. We see that at the end of Psalm 51. But David still paid a high price for his sin. I want to shift gears to our second point this morning. I think everybody's understanding that sexual sin harms. Let's, let's notice what, all, what else sexual sin does. Sexual sin also controls. Look in your Bibles at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 12 again. He's already said, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful, not all things are profitable. And then he says, All things uh, are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. This word dominated in your Bibles, it literally means enslaved. He says, I will not be enslaved by sexual sin. You see, if we're completely honest this morning, sexual sin is enslaving. Uh, there's this sort of dynamic of sex that is enslaving. You want more. Um, I'll share an example with you right quick. I mean this to be lighthearted. Uh, just because it's pretty thick in here. Everybody's counting ceiling tiles. I need to make sure everybody's still tuned in for a second. And it's hot. Boy, I'm going to turn the fan on. Maybe it won't blow our candles out. Uh, I can remember as a young man, uh, there's come a point in my life where uh, I desired a relationship with a lady. And, uh, I mean, it was, it was about the right time. I was in my second year of college, you know. And so, uh, as time went on, I found a lady and started talking to her and as we begin to talk you know I want to do things the right way and so uh, it took months and months of talking and uh, eventually I asked her if she would be my girlfriend we started the courtship and I'll never forget uh, you know as a young man thinking I really want to hold this girl's hand and so we were uh, boyfriend and girlfriend for months and months and months and we're driving down the road, and it took me about 30 minutes to get up enough nerve to hold her hand, and I thought that was all right. You know, I, I thought that was something else. And so there I was, got me a, a fine, dishy lady, and uh, I don't even know if that's the right terminology, but uh, <laughs> holding her hand. Well, about 30 minutes into holding her hand, my hand starts getting sweaty, and I thought, well, maybe this isn't all it's cracked up to be. And a couple more months went by, and I thought, man, I really like this girl, and... 
I think I want to kiss her right on the jaw. And so I'd worked up, it took me a long time to work up enough to do, nerve to do that. And so uh, at that point, I, I did. And then as time went on, mentally, for a young man, you begin to think, all right, God has a design in this. This is the way it should be. You know, I'd already made preparations and given out a ring and, and all these things. But this, at that point, that's where Satan begins to creep in in any relationship. And without God's principles in your life and without the proper training, uh, you begin to continue through that dynamic. And uh, to make a long story short, if you've ever been there, you understand that the trajectory is a, a very slippery slope. It's easy for someone who does not have God's principles in their life to continue in that trajectory. And there's a lot of people who, after they've exhausted that trajectory, move on to another relationship and another relationship. And sexual sin begins to stir. And what begins to happen over time is they're left with scar after scar, not only in their life, but in other people's life. Uh, the, the point is this, we have to be very careful, number one, in training students and training young people to understand that God has a plan uh, for the right execution of these desires. But we also need to understand that there's a lot of people who uh, get to a point in their life where they don't follow God's plan and they end up living a life relationship after relationship. You see, sexual sin is in, in Enslaving, they're looking for the next best thing, something better, something uh, more intense. Satan uses those desires. But here's the point. As believers, we have to make sure that that sexual desire is kept in check. Uh, we can't let sexual desire get us out of control. In fact, that, that completely opposes what God desires. This is what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Uh, verses 3 and 4 says this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. See, God's desire for your life as a believer is not for you to be out of control. It's to be in control and, and under the control of the Holy Spirit. And if you're going to stay away from sexual sin, then you've got to be in control. The Holy Spirit has to be in control of your life. If the Holy Spirit isn't leading you day by day, then those sexual desires are going to be completely out of control. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 13. It says, Paul says this, Put to death, that word literally means mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, uh, and you will live. We're to master the flesh. We're to gain control over the flesh. And, and it's easy for us as believers, or maybe your student here this morning, to get in a situation where those desires want to take control. And, and so what do we need to do? Paul says to keep our desires in check. I like what he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I invite you to turn there. 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 27. Listen to how intense Paul was with self-control. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number... I'm going I'm to start reading in the last part of verse 26. Uh, Paul says this, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, Paul in this passage, he's talking about boxing. We ask the question, well, who's Paul fighting? He's... He's fighting the flesh. He's fighting his, his body. Some of you guys have been there. Uh, you desire something. You're just fighting your body. Like, no, I, don't, I know I'm not supposed to do this. And, and so Satan starts tempting you. And what does Paul say here? Look in uh, verse 27. He's boxing. He's fighting. He says, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Uh, in my honest opinion, that's a, a pretty weak translation. Keep it under control. In fact, it, there's a worse, more intense translation that I think is, is more accurate. And that is the idea of, of giving your body a black eye. He's talking about boxing, and he says uh, to keep it under control. No, what Paul's saying is I give my body a black eye. I keep my body in check. When my body is tempted to run away with lust and desire, what I do, I give it a black eye. I keep it in check. Um, 
The, the word there is upiphtiazo. Again, you probably don't care, but it literally means to give a black eye. So this is a warning to us before we go on to heed the warning. The sin of lust, though it may start small, can grow and grow and consume your life. It's enslaving. You see people just continue to run back. Even Christians who've been bought with the price, continuing to run back to sexual sin. Why? Because it's enslaving and the progression gets worse and worse and worse and more intense. Does God forgive you? Yes. But you keep it up and you'll be a slave to your sin. Alright, so let's move on to our third point. Number th- we've talked about how sexual sin harms. We've talked about how sexual sin enslaves. Let's also notice third, how sexual sin perverts. Uh, now there's a few things I want to share with you before we conclude. There are in Scripture three distinct purposes or designs for our body that Satan perverts with sexual sin. So there's three good things that God uses our bodies for, but Satan likes to pervert it. Let's see the first thing. The first distinct purpose of our body uh, is that our body is for the Lord. Look in your Bibles at verse number 13. Chapter 6, verse number 13. Some of you guys, your Bible's getting a workout this morning. It's It's the hardest workout that your Bible's had in a couple of months. So let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse number 13. The Bible says, Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. You see how in your Bibles there's a little quotation around those words? That was a little saying there in Corinth. Hey, the food's meant for the body. body." But they were carrying that philosophy over to sexual immorality. Hey, you know what? God made our body. uh, Well, He he gave us food for our body. He also gave us sex for our body. You know, we... They're basically saying eating is no different than having sex. And and Paul's going to rebuke that idea here. See, God's going to destroy food. God's going to destroy uh, stomachs. But He has a a unique purpose for the body. It's different. Uh, The body is not meant for sexual sin. Look in your Bibles at verse number 14. It says, And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. So there's... Our body's different than our stomach. It's different. Uh, l- let me dig into this just a little bit more because this can be confusing. God has a purpose for our bodies. Uh, one day when Christ returns, our bodies will be raised. Some of our bodies will be rotten, they'll be decayed, but God is going to put them together and then we're going to receive our glorified body in heaven where we will d- dwell with Christ. Uh, so Paul is saying here at this point, Food, stomachs, all those things God will wipe out, but the body will be glorified and transformed in heaven. All right, here's our point. The body is for the Lord. What does this mean? As Christians, we need to understand God has a purpose for our bodies. Satan likes to take that purpose and use sexual sin to twist that truth. Sex is more than just a biological uh, function. It's more than just eating. Uh, Sex is a spiritual union between two people. God uses it. Uh, I read a book, uh, it's been years and years ago, but it was by C.S. Lewis. And uh, the name of the book was Screwtape Letters. Maybe you guys have heard of it. But C.S. Lewis talks about um, this particular topic. And he says this, Every time a man and a woman enter into a sexual relationship, A spiritual bond is established between them which must be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. What C.S. Lewis is trying to say, just like Paul, is our our bodies are more than just biological. They're spiritual. The body is not made for sex. It's made for the Lord. In fact, he says that here in verse 13. He says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for what? but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So there's one truth that Satan likes to pervert with his sin. Let's notice number two. Our bodies are also one with Christ. Sexual sin twists that as well. Look in your Bibles at verse number 15. It says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Here's the point. Whenever you become a Christian... Whenever you turn from sin, 
you become a member of the body of Christ. So we all have different functions, but we're all one body. Whenever you engage in sexual sin, what is that doing? That's bringing a disgrace. That's, that's one of the members of Christ's body joining with sexual sin. It brings disgrace to Christ. It doesn't just affect you when you commit sexual sin. It affects the body of Christ. It dishonors the Lord. It dishonors your family. Can you imagine if, if Christ was here in His earthly ministry, He's walking here on earth, and then somebody goes up to Him and, and asks Him the question, Lord, I'm, I'm going to go over here and commit adultery. Would you, would you want to come with me? You say, Brother Travis, that's, that's blasphemous. The same thing is true when a Christian commits sexual sin. There, if Christ is indwelled in us, it's as though we're, we're taking Christ with us to commit that sin. We're dragging Christ into it as well. So, sex is more than biological, it's spiritual. It's two individuals becoming one. It unites two people. Look at verse number 16. He goes on. He says, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Sex unites two people. Uh, verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Now here's the result. Look at verse number 18. Here's one of the most practical verses we'll read today. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. So how do we handle sexual sin? Maybe you're here this morning, you're a believer, you're just like the church of Corinth, and you're saying, man, I am struggling with sin. That's sin from my past. I'm just dragging it in to the church. How do we handle sexual sin? What did the Bible say? Get out of there. Flee from sexual sin. You can't have a problem if it's not around. You know, there's a man in Scripture by the name of Joseph, and he was a pretty smart man. He was encountered with this sin. Uh, there he was. He got in there into Potiphar's house, and here comes Potiphar's wife. Boy, she's laying it on thick. Joseph, you hunk of a man. What does Joseph do? He about vapor locks. Like, what am I going to do? He got out of there. He ran. He fleed. From sexual sin, the only part of Joseph that woman got was his coat. That's the way we're called to respond to sexual sin. D don't walk into a situation, maybe a student, you're dropped off at a friend's house, and, and things just turn sour real quick. Maybe you go out on a date with somebody, and things start turning sour really quick. What do you need to do? You need to flee from sexual sin. I don't know any parent in this room, if their child called them and said, Hey, will you please come and pick me up? I just... I need to get out of here. I don't know any parent that would say, no, you need to stay there. You wanted to go. <laughs> Parents are going to endorse you to flee, to get out of there. Maybe you're here and uh, you're, you're scrolling through your phone and some trash uh, appears on your phone. What do you do? You, you just get out of there. You close the tab. You, you put your phone up. You're reading a book. There's a lot of filthy, nasty books out there. There's a lot of filthy, nasty shows on TV. What do you do? You throw the book away. You turn the television off. You get away. You leave the bad situation. You get out of the room. How do you... You flee. Look in your Bibles at verse number 18. It says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now what does he mean here? What's Paul talking about? Again, he's talking about the uniqueness of sexual sin. It's, it's a lot different than other sins. Sexual sin is unique in its consequences. It destroys a man or a woman from the inside out. You see, this sin unites two people. And so it's, it's just it's different. It harms people. It will not only affect you, but it will affect the other person as well. Now, all sin blackens, but this sin, it enslaves people. 
Let's move on to our last point here this morning. Number three, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Verse number 19. The Bible says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own. All right, so he says, hey, you know what? Uh, your body, whenever you uh, come to Christ in faith, uh, like you're no longer running the show. Uh, you belong to somebody else. Uh, you're, you're now Christ. Now, why are we Christ? Why do we now belong to the Lord? Uh, look at verse number 20. For you were bought with a price. So, Christ paid the price for you. He, he paid the price for, for all of you. <laughs> Every, every bit of you. Now, what was the price that Christ had to pay for us? Well, let's read it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says this, He bought us not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. So, God bought you. Your body is no longer yours as a believer. You belong to someone else. You're under new management. And He's constantly working on you. But when you do commit sexual sin, what are you doing? You're dragging filth into somebody else's house. This is the Lord's house now. It's the resident of the Holy Spirit. This church here, Raymond Baptist Church, this building, is not the temple of God. Those of you in whom Christ dwells, you are the temple of God. So why would we defile it with sexual sin? All right, I want to go to an invitation. Really just apply this passage our heart right now. I see some people that are mentally checking out. Some of you are sweating like myself. So let's go to an invitation. I want to ask you a few questions this morning before we go on. After, after reading this passage of Scripture, after combing through it together, I know a lot of you in this room, uh, you, you show up to church not because you're going to get funny stories or you're going to get to sing a song and just, you know, maybe I'll get to have a conversation. No, you come because you want to hear God's Word and apply it to your life. Well, here it is. Here's the questions I want to ask. I want you to allow the Lord to work in your heart. So, do you, after we read God's Word and went through it, do you understand that sexual sin harms? Do you understand that? Have you allowed that to not only go into your mind, but work into your heart? Yeah. If I continue this, if they continue this, it's going to bring about harm. Do you understand that? That's the first question. Do you understand it's going to affect you? Do you understand it's going to affect other people? Do you understand it's going to affect your marriage? Do you understand it's going to affect your family? Do you understand sexual sin will affect Raymond Baptist Church, who's called to be holy and blameless? Do you understand that if you continue on in the way that you're going, there's going to be deep-rooted damage? Yeah, there'll be forgiveness, but it's going to take a lot of healing. Do you understand... Uh, that sin over promises but under delivers. So maybe you're here this morning and, and you're caught up in that enslavement and you think, man, if I could just get to this point, if I could just have this relationship, I would be satisfied. But do you understand that when done out of the context in which God calls and out of His will, it's, you're going to be drinking from a fountain that just tells you to come back. Uh, it's going to leave you more thirsty. And when you first come. Next question. Do you want to get to the end of your life and look back with regret? You want to look back and those desires cost you your honor and your respect? Because you gave in to those sins, there's a lack of respect. Do you want to get to the end of your life and look back and maybe it even cost you your finances? You don't have a retirement anymore. There were real... <laughs> Consequences from your sin. It cost you a marriage. Another question, phrased in a different light. Do you understand that sex is a gift from the Lord? I mean, you know, we, we downplay that, we, we giggle. But do you understand that it is a gift for the, from the Lord and it's to be used in its proper context? There are many people that struggle with sexual sin because they're not drinking from their own fountain that the Lord's provided for them. 
Do you understand that sexual sin is enslaving? Just uh, If you're a student here this morning, I just want to remind you for just a second. You're probably in a season of life where you're beginning to think through these things and pray about these things and, and to study through these things. I want you to mark my words and remember this. Um, you need to, even at this point, start putting up safeguards in your life. Because sexual sin is enslaving, it's so easy to find yourself just sliding out of control. What I'm saying is, begin to think through and talk to your parents or your youth pastor about what is courtship. Like, stop playing this American game of just dating. That's why maybe many people here this morning have scars on their past. Because they did play the dating game. They were looking for something. Put up safeguards. Don't just go places with your girlfriend without telling your parents where you're going. Or, I mean, there's, there's accountability out there. Don't be laying on the floor watching a movie. You're just asking for Satan to step in. Don't stand at this, the front of this church and have to look back at your bride or your husband with regret. Because you just frivolously, you know, just walked through the invitation this morning. You just didn't care. It doesn't apply to me. But I'm encouraging you, take this in and internalize it so you don't have to have those scars in your past. So what do we do with our bodies? What does the Bible say? I want to read the last verse. Apparently I didn't read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 20 says this. What do we do with our bodies? The Bible says this. It says, For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. How do you do that? Worship Him. Praise Him. Allow the Lord to work with His Spirit in your heart so he, it is a temple for which He can dwell. And it's a temple in which other people can worship. Allow yourself to be preserved before marriage. Allow the Lord to work in your heart and cleanse you up and and allow the Holy Spirit to kill that sin in your life. We go to the Lord in prayer. I want to pray for us before our invitation. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. I understand this isn't a really uh, this isn't a holiday message, but it's a message you've called us to look at this morning. Lord, we're thankful for Christmas because it's only through Christ that we could have the power to say no to sin. It's through the cross and through what you have done and a relationship with you that we can understand the proper context of sex. And it's, it's the place in which we can enjoy it and worship you through it, understanding that you're the giver of it. Uh, it's through Christ that we can enter into a relationship not seeking selfish desires, but seeking to, uh, to serve our spouse and to love them. Lord, a topic that many would blush over. I pray that we would listen to it and internalize it for the health of our own soul. I pray that you would cause the one here this morning that is engaged in sexual sin to repent, uh, to flee, to get away from it. Show us what a 180 looks like, a complete turning repentance action through your Holy Spirit. Lord, Help us to understand that there is forgiveness and help us ask for it. But for the one that's struggling this morning, I pray that you would be with them. Help them to understand they can't say no on their own. They have to have a relationship with you first. Lord, help us in this invitation. Whatever you want to do, Lord, we're going to glorify you in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.